Hello people of the interwebs, my name is Luke, and today I'm going to be talking to you about polymers. They are absolutely everywhere, from plastic bags all the way to the proteins in your body, you just can't escape them. And because there's so many types and uses, I'm just going to cover one specific section of polymers today. And as you may have already guessed by the video title, that is living polymers in nanomaterials and medicines. So the big question, what is a polymer? Well, a polymer is just a long chain of repeating units, and those repeating units are called monomers. Probably one of the most widely used and simplest polymers in the entire world is polyethylene. This is made from ethylene or ethene molecules. Obviously, we can have much more complicated polymers than polyethylene, but one that I would like to mention now that's not too complicated is polyethylene glycol. As I'll show later in the video, it's very, very important. Polyethylene glycol contains many carbon to oxygen bonds, which means it's very polar. This means that it's attracted to polar solvents like water. This renders it very useful in medicines as it interacts very well with blood. But enough about what polymers are, how do we make them? There are two main types of polymers step growth and chain growth. I won't really go into what step growth polymers are, but I will say that they're made through a lot of condensation reactions, and examples include nylons, Kevlar, and polypeptides. So let's think about how to make chain growth polymers. Well, to start off, you really need an unsaturated monomer, which means it has a triple or a double bond. Once we have our monomers, we need to go through three steps. Initiation, propagation, and termination. We can go through these three steps in three different ways as well, through radical, cationic, and anionic polymerization. Now, I'm not really gonna talk about radical or cationic polymerization because they're not too important to the topic overall. I will say that radical polymerization involves initiating with a radical such as a peroxide that's been treated under heat, and a cationic polymerization reaction involves using a Lewis acid of some sort as an initiator. The polymerization technique I really need to explain is anionic polymerization. In the initiation step of this reaction, an anion, which is a negatively charged ion, attacks the carbon at the double bond. This wouldn't usually happen because both the double bond and the anion have a high electron density and would usually repel. However, if there's an electron withdrawing group on the adjacent carbon to the one that's attacked, the reaction will take place. This is because the resulting carbon ion formed is stabilized by the electron withdrawing group. One such example would be a carbonyl. This carbonyl then attacks another monomer in the same way it was attacked by the initiator. This adds another monomer unit to the chain, resulting in another carbonyl. This reaction then repeats, and this is the propagation step. And finally, we get to the termination step. And this is where anionic polymerization differs from radical and cationic. As long as there are no electrophiles present and the solvent uses a protic, meaning it can't give a proton to the polymer chain, the polymer chain will not terminate. So why is this so important? Well, it means when the reaction finishes, pretty much all of the monomers are used up. And if the initiation step is faster than the propagation step, we can calculate very easily the chain length for the most part. Not only that, but we can actually add more monomers to the polymer and they could actually be of a different type to the original monomers. This can result in a block copolymer where there are two different types of monomers kind of separated into different blocks. And the process by which this is made is called living polymerization. Block copolymers have a massive use in nanomedicine because if we have an amphiphilic block copolymer, which means that one part of it is hydrophilic and attracted to water and one is hydrophobic and not attracted, in water solution, it will actually form itself into a nanoparticle where the hydrophilic section is facing the water and the hydrophobic is kind of hidden on the inside. This is called a nanoparticle because it's only a few hundred nanometers in width. And remember, a nanometer is a billionth of a meter. So what can we do with these nanoparticles that we tend to call micelles? Well, we can actually kind of hide drugs inside of them. 
because some drugs are very hydrophobic and don't stay in the blood for very long, and so are expelled from the body very easily. Not only that, but a lot of research in nanoparticles these days is going into cancer treatment. Now, cancer treatment is very difficult because cancer cells are basically the same as our cells with only very few defining features. However, it's been shown through clinical trials that if you take cisplatin, a drug very commonly used in chemotherapy, and put it in a polymeric shell of polyethylene glycol, which I've said earlier is hydrophilic, and a polyamino acid, then it will actually achieve much better results and lower toxicity than just cisplatin on its own in the bloodstream. So why does this happen? Well, it turns out the blood vessels leading to cancerous cells have quite large gaps in between their own cells, generally about a few hundred nanometers. However, for healthy cells, the gaps are much smaller. So nanoparticles can pass through the gaps in tumorous blood vessels, but not healthy blood vessels. Other studies have been done using other drugs such as doxorubicin, which is used to treat a wide variety of cancers. Now these studies differed slightly to the ones for cisplatin because they actually added two more targeting features to the drug and the polymeric shell. First of all, they added a hydrozone linkage between the hydrophobic part of the polymer and the drug. This is because cancerous cells have a slightly lower pH than that of healthy cells at a pH of about 6. This meant that the hydrozone linkage would break within cancerous cells, but not healthy cells, releasing the drug mainly only into cancerous cells. They also added folic acid to the outside of the micelle. Folic acid is also known as vitamin B9, and it turns out that cancerous cells have overexpressed folic acid receptors, which allowed the drug more easily into the cancerous cells than the healthy ones. The studies showed a much higher uptake of the drug in cancerous cells than healthy cells, showing a much lower toxicity in in vitro trials. So hopefully you've seen that living polymers are very useful in nanomedicines, and a lot of the studies I've talked about today are currently in phase one, two, or three clinical trials. So in the next few years, they may even be going out to the public ready to save people's lives. Apart from that, there's a bunch more research going on in the area, not just for cancer as well, but I really wanted to focus on that today. So thank you very much for watching, and I hope you learned something.